played, I mean, I'll still briefly introduce myself, but I'll, I'll give a shorter version today. Uh, yesterday I said, I'm a statistician and I work in general in, uh, in, in the biological field. So I, I develop methods in, in uh, computational biology. Uh, so yesterday we've seen the first part of kind of my uh, my research, the research I've done, which is in uh, stochastic stochastic modeling of single cell data in systems biology. Uh, and today I'll, I'll talk about the second half, uh, which is what I did uh, in Zurich. Uh, oh, I see you, University, okay, University of Zurich, uh, which is statistical methods for bioinformatics data. So here uh, I'm actually going to talk about in the end our packages, so statistical software tools. Uh, again, yesterday I said the main two reasons for using a Bayesian approach are latent variables, so missing data basically, uh, which are due to the measurement error and to the measurement process of biological data. And the same is going to, is going to hold today in bioinformatics and prior knowledge. Yesterday I showed how we embedded prior from other experiments. Today it's mostly going to be about other genes. In bioinformatics you analyze a lot of genes and you can still use some information from the other genes. Um, yeah. Maybe just to fully be clear, I don't always go for the Bayesian way. Like we had an, a non-parametric approach, which, which is not here. Uh, but but I'm, I'm, I mostly go for the Bayesian approach. So bandits is the first method I, um, I developed in, in Zurich. Uh, and the luck is not particularly fancy. I, I know of, I go for simple, simple plain uh, uh, logos. Uh, no, I'm not particularly good at graphics. But it's 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 a method in conductor for to study alternative splicing. So I'll very briefly introduce the uh, the background biological background, which is a bit embarrassing because you all know more biology than I do. But I'll, I'll try not to to do to say anything silly. So in description, a molecule of RNA is transcribed from the DNA. Uh, but this immature um, unspliced molecule has both exons and introns. And with splicing, we the introns are removed or spliced out, and the exons are basically put together. And so this generates a mature or spliced molecule of mRNA, like that one, which only has the typically only has the exons. Now, this process can actually be done in several ways, and therefore it can generate several distinct mRNAs or transcripts. Uh, for instance, in, in this case, we have all the five exons, which are here. In this case, the third exon was removed or spliced out. And this, was, this is called exon skipping. In this case, the fourth exon was skipped. Okay, So there are various biological processes uh, that can basically generate several mRNAs. That's not particularly important here. The key point is that a single D gene can actually code for, can actually generate several mRNAs that can code for different proteins. So this is a a quite important flexible mechanism because it allows a single gene to generate multiple proteins. But as usual, these things can go wrong and can be this process can be disrupted in some diseases. And so it can be interesting to study variations in this process. And so that's exactly what our tool does. We study differential alternative splices, so changes in the alternative splicing patterns of every gene. And we normally do that across experimental conditions like healthy disease or treatment A, treatment B, or untreated, treated patients, and so on. Um, so what do we look for in particular? Uh, because this is quite vague, differences in alternative splicing. Well, we look for differences in the relative abundance of transcripts. So you see here, we have, for instance, three transcripts from a specific gene we can look for the proportion or relative abundance of these transcripts, like 70%, 20 10%. And we look for changes in these relative abundances across conditions. So one condition could have 70 20 10%. Another condition would have uh, 50 40 10 for example. And this is quite different from canonical differential gene um, uh, expression, where you actually look for changes, first of all, at the gene level, so you don't care about the specific isoforms. You only look at the overall, um, the overall gene abundance. And secondly, you look at actual abundance, not relative changes. So you look in that case at changes in your overall abundance at the gene level. Well, here we look for changes in the relative abundance of transcripts within a gene. 
so in practice, what kind of data do we use? Well, we use bulk RNA-seq data. Uh, again, bulk means we have an average signal across many cells. So this is not single cell data anymore. We're averaging the signal of many cells and we compare two or more groups. So mathematically to do that, we would like to ideally observe the expression of transcripts. So again, this naive example, we have three transcripts. We would like to know how many RNA secretes are coming from transcripts A, B, and C. But unfortunately, that is typically not available because the RNA secretes are normally compatible with multiple transcripts. So consider this, uh, again, even simpler example with two transcripts only, blue and red, and some reads that align on top. So you see some reads align to positions which are unique and are compatible with one transcript only. So the, this read is only compatible with the blue transcript. These reads are compatible with the red one only. And so we are sure, we're confident uh, of, of what transcript they're actually originating from. But most of the reads actually come from ambiguous regions and are compatible with both blue and red transcripts. And this is typically the case in RNA-seq data. And so in this case, we don't really know what, what, transcript, what transcript these reads are coming from. Now, you probably know algorithms like Summon and Callisto, which basically use an EM approach to estimate the amount of these reads, which, are, which is coming from the red and blue transcripts. And eventually, in the end, they give an estimated abundance of the red and blue transcripts. Now, the issue is that there is a lot of uncertainty in those estimates. And so if we want to then build a differential method based on those estimates, we have to account for the uncertainty in them. We cannot just plug it. Well, we could just plug in those estimates, but we're, we're neglecting the uncertainty. And so the inferential results are going to be affected. So in order to account for the uncertainty in these reads, we avoid this quantification step that, that comes from, you know, the typically Salmon or Callisto or our SEM, and we try to input the raw data, which is basically the equivalence classes. So what transcripts each read is compatible with. So in this, again, toy example, we would basically input this kind of data. One read is compatible with the blue transcript only, this one. Then two reads are compatible with the red transcript only, those ones. And then seven are compatible with both blue and red. And these are the, um, these are the reads. And so what we're going to do is again, have we're going to have missing data. We have a latent variable approach because these seven reads are coming from one of the two transcripts, but we don't know which one they're coming from. And so we again use a latent variable approach and a data augmentation approach, which is what I described yesterday, where we treat the allocation of these seven reads as a parameter. So again, we have enlarged our parameter space. These seven reads are now, the allocation of these seven reads is now a parameter that we're going to sample. So we will sample in the MCMC the allocation of these reads to the transcript of origin. Um, so let's consider the general case where we have a gene. So again, we're considering just one experimental condition, say healthy samples, one specific gene. So this gene has K transcripts, and we have N biological replicates, so N samples from a condition, like the healthy, healthy samples. So we assume that the, the, um, the counts at the gene level are distributed across the transcripts from a multinomial distribution. So this is count data. A gene has NI counts. We assume that they're distributed uh, as a multinomial across the K transcripts. Now, the key parameter of inference here is the, this pi that basically tells us the relative abundance of the transcripts in this specific sample. So again, like yesterday, we have multiple samples, typically, you know, in a three versus three group comparison, we have three samples or, or five samples. Normally, it's quite small number of samples. So we don't assume that this parameter, this parameter vector is the same across all samples. And we use, again, a hierarchical model. So we have we are set each sample as a distinct parameter, but there is a common prior, which is a Dirichlet. And so thanks to this, again, I'm saying this again just in case you, uh, you know, you were not present yesterday uh, or you missed this part. But again, with our, with our hierarchical model, there is flexibility because parameters can vary between cells, but there is also sharing of information. Now, and so now we have these hyperparameters. So these are the group level parameters. 
uh, deltas, which can be interpreted as follows. So the summation of the deltas is the so-called precision parameter, and it tells us the degree of variability between samples. So that, that governs the sample to sample variability. And then this pi bar, which are basically the normalized deltas, these guys represent the relative abundance of transcripts, but not anymore at the individual level. So not anymore for the individual biological replicate, but at the group level. So this is the average relative abundance at the group level. And basically the precision tells us how this rel average relative abundance changes from sample to sample, from biological replicate to biological replicate. So here we get to the informative prior part. Now, this, these parameters obviously are different for every gene, but there's going to be a similarity across them. So in particular, this uh, precision parameter here, okay, um, we can actually get for this parameter an initial estimate uh, from another model, so it's not our model, on our data. And so we, we get that estimate for all our genes, which have at least two transcripts, so it's thousands of estimates. And then we can compute for these thousands of estimates a mean and a standard deviation. And that will represent our informative prior for the precision parameter. In practice, to be a little bit technical, we do that on the log scale. So it's log of this precision parameter. We get many estimates and we can compute a mean and a standard deviation. And that allows us to formulate an informative prior. Again, this is mild empirical base. So empirical base means that you use your data to formulate an informative prior, and then you analyze your data. So in a way, that's slightly wrong because you analyze your data twice. Now, this is what we're doing here, but it's extremely mild because every gene will contribute in a very small fraction of this estimate because this estimate will be based on thousands of genes. And so each gene will give a very, very minor contribution. So this is extremely mild empirical base because every gene contributes in a very minor fraction. Uh, and then we use a similar scheme to what I've shown yesterday, which is called Metropolis within Gibbs, which, which sounds like fancy, but it's really simple. I mean, you just, you just block, you just do blocks of the parameters because simply you cannot update all the parameters you have in one shot. So you, you just separate them in, into many blocks and you update each block at a time, conditional on the rest. So it's something very natural. And so we have our three main blocks are the, as you've seen, the hyperparameters, the hierarchical ones, and then the latent states. So for the hyperparameters, we follow a metropolis sampler. For the hierarchical ones, we use what's called a Gibbs sampler. I'm not sure you've seen this, but this is computationally more efficient because you don't need to sample and then accept reject. You just sample directly from the target distribution. So this is actually very efficient because you always accept what you sample. And same thing for the latent states. They're sampled from a, from a Gibbs sampler. So although we have many parameters, most of them follow a Gibbs sampler. Only few have a, an acceptance, acceptance rejection step, which makes it actually quite efficient in terms of uh, mixing a convergence. Um, also for the latent states, I just want to give an idea of how we, we do the, the sampling of the latent state. So assume you have an ambiguous read, and this read is, is compatible with transcripts J and K. Well, then we can just compute the relative abundance of transcript J and over, you know, normalized so over the, the, the relative abundance of transcripts J and K. And the same for transcript K. And so now in each iteration of the MCMC, this ambiguous read is going to be allocated to transcript J with probability, well, basically proportional to the relative abundance of the transcript. And it's going to be allocated to transcript K with probability, again, proportional to the relative abundance of transcript K. Uh, I'll, I'll take the question. Um, are the different genes have different samples? Uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 it's a bit noisy. Okay, uh, the question is, uh, are different genes uh, have different samplers? Like, are each different gene like uh, handled differently, or are they all handled kind of at once in the big sampler? Uh, the mathematical construction is the same. We still follow a multinomial, usually a prior, informative prior, and this uh, sampling in blocks. Uh, but each gene is analyzed separately. So this is for a single gene. 
A single gene has a multinomial, of course, it's transcripts. Also because... We didn't talk about multinomial in our class yet, right? Uh, yeah, so just briefly, a, a binomial is where you just have a probability for one event multinomial and when you have different events possible and each have their probability. I so we're you. Yeah. Well, why is it multinomial here? Uh, because you can have more than two transcripts. You can, yeah. You kind of you, you generally have k. I mean, k is kind of general. Two to well, a uh, possibly large number. Is that clear? Transcripts in a sample. Yeah, uh, for a gene can have multiple so, transcripts, multiple uh, maybe, uh, type maybe, of transcripts. Maybe I would say you should have clarified. Uh, Obviously, we don't do this for genes that don't display alternative splicing. I mean, some genes may be associated to a single transcript. In that case, there is no alternative splicing, right? Uh, all, all We obviously only analyze genes where there is alternative splicing. So there are at least two transcripts or three, four, you know, as many as the gene has. In that case, we can study differences in alternative splicing. With multinomial, you can. Yeah. Right? When there is more than two. Right. And uh, and uh, why I don't know anything about the hierarchical aspect of this Hegesian Like I don't know, maybe it made sense yesterday with the yeah. hierarchical with different model, but today I'm not, I don't know. Okay, so there is a question about the hierarchical aspect of uh, of the model. What? Maybe you have the hierarchical aspect of the modeling. Uh huh. Um, so, I mean, conception again, um, I mean, forget, forget about what we're looking at. Uh, let's take it generally. You have parameters. In this case, the parameters are pi, but it doesn't really matter. You have parameters. We have biological replicates. We don't assume that every biological replicate has the same parameters. That would be unrealistic. So we allow each sample, each replicate to have a distinct parameter. So that's why the I, the I represents the replicates. Uh, but then we don't also, at the same time, on the other hand, we don't analyze each replicate independently because that, that would allow a different value for every replicate, but it would be silly because we would, we would analyze them separately. You know, they share, they share information between them. And so the way they share information is via the, the, their, their hyper prior parameters delta. So these are the, see, pi i are the sample specific parameters, and then delta is the group level parameters. Um, now, in particular, get into the example, these are the relative abundances. So we say, in a way, you can qualitatively take it like that. Uh, all samples don't have exactly the same relative abundance of transcripts. You know, there will be biological variation. Even if a transcript is dominant, Maybe in uh, in one sample, it's like 80% dominant. In another sample, it dominates with like 70% of the reads. In another one, 90. There is some variability. And then you have at the group level, you can think of the average uh, at the group level in terms of relative abundance. And so you can think of like 80% uh, as the average relative abundance of the first transcript with some variation from sample to sample. Is, is that, that actually clear? I think, <coughs> I think so. Is it? Okay. No, it's the same, it, conceptually, it's the same thing as a mixed model in, in frequent statistics. You know, you allow for, you model multiple samples, but you allow for variation between them. I, I, I actually conceptually prefer hierarchical models because I think the more, well, I mean, you can see the hierarchy, but. Okay, thank you. Okay. I don't remember about the Dirichlet distribution from yesterday. Uh, yeah, there is a question also about the yeah. Dirichlet, uh, Dirichlet uh, uh, distribution. So, so what's up with it? Why we're still using it? Uh, no, what it is. Oh, it, it's just a distribution. Um, now, why are we using the Dirichlet? Um, so the pi's are between 0 and 1, and the Dirichlet is a distribution which gives values between 0 and 1. Okay. Uh, so it, you know, you, you need to have some some a distribution that reflects your data, right? So the the, the pr probabilities are between zero and one, and their summation is one. So the Dirichlet is a distribution that gives those kind of values. Uh, second advantage, the Dirichlet is conjugate compared to the multinomial, 
meaning that uh, this is a bit technical, but that the conditional distribution of, of pi, conditional on delta and on x, is a Dirichlet, which means that here, pi given delta and x, if we use a Dirichlet, then we know this conditional distribution exactly, and we can sample from it straight away. So it's a conjugate choice, it's a convenient choice, because it simplifies the algorithm. So part of the computation becomes analytic, so you can exactly. have this part go much faster because of, mm -hmm. you don't have then to rely on the computational uh, simulation and so on and so forth. And, uh, and so it, it is a good, it is a realistic choice among, I mean, it's one of the several plausible choices, but this one has the advantage that, that the solution is actually analytic for this, for this part of the model. Thank you. And why is there three samplers? Is there, sorry? Can I forget? Uh, the scheme of metropolis within Gibbs uh, to you block the parameters. That's what you are uh, asking. Is that a question? Yeah, I think the, the question is about uh, why you made the choice of, of having the metropolis within Gibbs in these three uh, layers. Uh, well, I mean, because the distant parameters I mean, they, they actually, you know, each parameter is sampled from a, a distribution, right? Uh, eventually, you want to target the full distribution of parameters, but that's quite hard to target directly. So you normally split it, split it into blocks, which are easier to sample from. So in this case, uh, we, naturally block, we naturally sample the hyper parameters because they have a specific conditional distribution. Then we sample the hierarchical ones because the conditional distribution of the hierarchical parameters is a, is a Dirichlet. Then we sample the latent variables because the conditional distribution of the latent variables is a multinomial. And so that, that makes a natural choice for how to split this. Was that like per sample or per, per? Well, I mean, this is, this is a bit of a schematic. In practice, it's more complex. Uh, these are, this is more like the, the, the grand scale, like three categories. But then within here, uh, every sample is has a different distribution here. So each sample has a Dirichlet distribution. So this is actually, we have n, n biological replicates. So it means that this is done n times. So we sample the values n times. Uh, and this as well, it's actually multiple multinomials because equivalence class, Will, will have a multinomial distribution, but they're all independent. I mean, in this step, this conditional bit is all independent. So you sample them one after the other. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, this is done uh, for a specific gene, but uh, we have normally multiple, I mean, we have normally, we, we always have multiple genes. We have thousands of genes. Um, and so, you know, in, in Bayesian statistics, you, you, you might've seen that, you want to afterwards make sure that your posterior chains have converged, that they look good, that you know they they mix well, that they're converged in a reasonable place. Uh, but obviously, so normally you would somehow look at the at the posterior chains of your of your parameters. If you have many parameters, you can look at summaries uh, like the mean and so on. But here we have thousands of genes, so there is and, and this by the way, this is a tool for users. There is, there is no way users who don't know Bayesian statistics can look at thousands of trace plots. Obviously, this is uh, uh, this is unfeasible. And so we use an automatic convergence test uh, that automatically assesses if the chains have converged or not. So this is not these tools are not particularly accurate. Just to clarify, these automatic convergence tools are just better than nothing because there is no alternative here, and it ensures that the chains don't really fail. But don't take this, I mean, in general, don't take this as a fantastic uh, method for assessing convergence, because still the best way to do it is visual inspection. Um, now here we also have um, a computational challenge because this is, again, this is a Bayesian hierarchical model with latent states, but we want to run roughly 10,000 of these models or so thousands of these models. And, and so in practice, uh, this can become very, very heavily, uh, very, very heavy from a computational perspective. So what we do is to um, to run this method in parallel. So each gene is running parallel, 
and we code the algorithm in C++ because this is an R package, but R is terribly slow for this kind of loops. And so we actually code the, the, the key part, the MCMC in C++. And so on average, every gene takes less than one second. Aggregating all genes, we're talking about like one hour roughly on a laptop, uh, which is very slow for a bioinformatician, but but I, I think, I, I mean, from a statistical perspective, uh, it's, it's, it's actually absolutely acceptable. Um, now, a tiny detail, um, transcripts have different lengths. You see here, not all transcripts have the same length. So longer transcripts will have more reads because they're longer. So it's more likely that reads align to that place. Now, this is not an issue because we're looking at relative abundance across conditions. So this is going to affect equally all conditions. But when we compute this relative abundance of the transcripts and we test for that parameter, we're actually testing the wrong thing because we don't want to test how many reads are compatible with the transcripts. We actually want to test the relative abundance of the actual biological mRNAs. And so to go from one to the other, we just divide by the effective length of the transcripts. And so we go from the relative, the proportion of reads that map to the transcripts to the proportion of actual biological transcripts. So that's a tiny detail, but we go from basically pi to what I call pi t, and we test this new parameter here, which again accounts for the length. It's a marginal thing, but it gives a, a bit of an improvement in performance because, well, it's quite logical. We're testing now the right, the right biological object. Um, and so now we want to do a test and compare two conditions. So say we, we have done, we have run the previous model that I showed on two conditions, A and B, healthy disease. And we want to do a test on these two conditions. Now, how do we do that? Well, we consider the difference in the relative abundance of the group level relative abundance. So at the group level between A and B. Now, under the null, these two differences are zero because there is no difference in the, in the splicing patterns. While under the alternative, there is some difference. Now, I don't know if, you, if you've seen the aspect, but uh, doing statistical testing from a Bayesian point of view is actually very challenging. So this is one of the main drawbacks for me, at least, uh, in Bayesian statistics. It's very hard to do statistical testing. Um, and so normally people use base factors. Uh, but uh, as I was saying yesterday, the computation of base factors is, is, is non-tricky. It's very hard. It's... Um, it can be very unstable and it's very hard to get good estimates of the base factor. So here we did something which is extremely unusual. Um, and, and which is, we basically went back to the frequentist word. So we basically take these differences, these are the omegas, and we approximate these differences by a normal distribution where the, the mean and the covariance of this normal are obtained from the posterior chains. Now we are actually, I mean, a bit surprisingly, we noticed that this difference actually is approximated really well by a normal distribution. And then once you have approximated this difference by a normal, then it's very easy to use a multivariate wall test. Uh, and, and that is just the multivariate version of the classical wall test. Um, and this gives us basically a gene level test. And we do exactly the same thing on the individual transcripts. Now we look at just the difference on, on one of the omegas, so one of the transcripts. And this allows us to have both gene and transcript level tests. So what's the advantage here? The gene level test tells you if there are differences in the splicing patterns in the overall gene. But then once you have found that a gene has differences in the splicing patterns, you probably want to know what transcripts are actually involved. And so that, that is what the transcript level test tells you. The transcript level test tells you what are the individual transcripts that are changing between conditions? Because in some genes, you may have a large number of transcripts and only some of them are changing. Um, so after I explain the method, uh, I'll get into how more or less we try to assess the performance. Uh, we've done several simulation studies. I'm, I'm going to show you the main one here. Uh, the way we simulate data is to try to make it basically as realistic as possible to real data, but also introducing a ground truth. So introducing a real differential effect that we try to recover. So here we basically infer parameters from real data. 
and then we simulate from these parameters. Now we simulate what's called at the, at the read level. So this means that we basically, we don't simulate from like the, the multinomial distribution. That would be too naive. We actually simulate RNA-seq reads. And then we have to go through the you know, alignment and quantification procedure. So we have to align this to a reference genome or transcriptome and get our inferential results and get our basically the input data, the equivalence classes. So this simulation has the uh, uncertainty in the mapping that we want to model. And we try then to compare two groups of six samples where obviously we have artificially introduced a difference in the alternative splicing pattern in one of the two groups. And then we check how well the method is able to recover that difference. Uh, and we benchmark obviously against several competitors because our method is not the only one that does this kind of analysis. So you see here, there is a list of various competitors. In green, you have bandits, but then you have a bunch of other competitors. And I'm not sure you're familiar with this kind of plot. This is similar to rock. You have true positive rate. So you want to re recover as many true positives as possible. Uh, and on the, on the X axis, you don't have the false positive rate, but you have the false discovery rate, um, which tells you basically how many false discoveries you have in your set of significant genes. So you want these to be basically as small as possible. You would like to be towards the top left corner. So you see bandits is in green here. It, it has good control of the false discovery rate because you see these this circles are close to the theoretical lines or close or conservative. They shouldn't be, sorry, they shouldn't be more extreme. And then at the same time, you have a good, uh, you have, we have higher true positive rate, meaning that than other methods, meaning that we can recover more real differential splicing patterns than other methods. And we see pretty much the same when we do a transcript level test. Uh, so this plot for us was for a gene level test. We have pretty much the same for a transcript level test. Uh, we got a good control of this false discovery rate and also get a good uh, true positive rate. You see, there's fewer methods because not all methods allow you to do a transcript level test. Some methods, well, several methods only do a gene level test. And uh, lastly, we've also looked at a real data set. Now, real data sets are good because they're realistic, but they don't have a ground truth. So it's hard to evaluate if a method does well or wrong or does well or not. Um, so thankfully, in this data set, we had a bunch of genes, 82, uh, which had been validated in the lab. And so we're confident that these 82 genes are uh, uh, display really display uh, differences in the alternative splicing patterns. And so we've done something like a rock curve, which is curve, of course is very rough because we're saying that these 82 genes are true positives and the remaining genes are don't display alternative splicing, which is wrong. But it still gives us an idea of how well we can recover these 82 genes. And again, you see that we get higher, I mean, for a given false positive threshold, uh, we get here in green higher true positive rate. So, I mean, I, I don't really like uh, showing off uh, with these kind of plots, but, but it's an indication that the method is, is doing well and it's recovering well the right, the right uh, genes. Now, obviously, th this is because uh, this method is accounting for the very uncertainty between samples, so with a hierarchical model, but importantly also in the mapping, so the technical variability, basically. Uh, but this comes at a cost because you know having uh, you know thousands of full MC, mo MC models with linear variables that's quite computationally expensive. Um, and so, if you see here, the cost of the method is here. It's actually halfway through. Uh, so in blue here, you have the actual cost of the pipeline that comes before. So, you know, when you run Salmon, Callisto, RSEM, and so on. And you see that that is actually, most of the times, that's a major cost in the analysis. Um, and then you have, the in red, the actual the actual uh, cost of, uh, of, of, the, of the differential method. And so if we zoom here and we consider only these methods which share the same input, you see that we are the lowest among these methods, but the computational cost, at least from my perspective, is still reasonable because it just takes one hour on, on a laptop to do, to do a differential analysis. And all the other methods, they input, uh, I mean, they don't 
do this allocation of the latent variables, which is the, the costly thing. So uh, wrapping up briefly, uh, this method, we've developed this method to detect genes and transcripts that display differences in alternative splicing from bulk rna seq data. I didn't mention this, but the method works with both alignment to the transcriptome with Salmon or Callisto and to the genome with STAR. Uh, the key feature is that mathematically it models the uncertainty in the mapping as well as the variability between samples. Um, a weaker rate for the difference in the lens of the trans of, of the transcripts, and we do testing at the gene and transcript level. It has good performance, but obviously it's lower than other methods, and it does not allow for covariates like batch effects. But most of the times, batch effects don't affect relative abundance of transcripts because they normally affect overall abundance at the gene level, and this is not this is, doesn't play a role when you look at relative abundances. So this is. Uh, unlikely to have an effect on relative abundance of transcripts. Now, I don't want to run late, but if there are questions about band, maybe I'll take them now. There okay. was a discussion yeah. more or less in the chat about um, but Suzanne and Van Driel had, and, uh, but I think it's it's has been solved among them. I don't know, Vandril, if you want to ask. Otherwise, go ahead. Excuse me, I mean, I'm sorry, I was struggling with my unmute button. There was a question in the room. Is one sample a batch? Uh, so a batch effect is when you have a bunch of sample where, for instance, sequencing another center or something like this is one kind of potential latent. Uh, and it could be one sample at a time. Sorry? And it could be that you sequence one sample at a time. Yeah, in which case, if you if they were sequencing in completely different condition, that might be uh, not ideal. But the, in that particular, for that particular problem, apparently that's not too much problematic because usually the sort of batch effect that you expect are not the one that affect what you are looking at, right, Simon? Uh, yes. So if so, with batch effect, we mean like if you have say three samples. And you analyze them into a machine, and you get I don't know, three samples in a different batch. You will observe systematic differences normally between them, and sometimes you want to correct for them. But what I was saying in this case is that those differences normally affect gene expression and not the relative abundance of transcripts. Uh, second thing, if you analyze every sample in a different batch, that does not introduce a bias, but it increases the variance. Okay, so let's distinguish between bias and variance. When you analyze three samples in a batch and three samples in a different batch, that introduces a bias between them. But if every sample is in a different batch, well, there is you're not biasing your analysis, but you're definitely increasing a lot of the variance because now the difference between samples is not only the biological difference, but it also has a, a, a batch difference. So there is, there is a lot of variance. So it's not ideal, it's not biasing results, but it's not ideal because you have a lot of variance. That is kind of unnecessary. Other questions? Okay. Um, I have a small question. So uh, you you account for a difference in uh, in size between the different uh, transcripts. Yeah. But have you also looked at uh, other potential potential? Uh, effect that may affect mappability. I know that uh, GC persons may sometimes play a role or something like that. Is this something that if we have information to this information could be plugged in? So what, what kind of thing did you did you mention? I couldn't hear. Uh, GC persons sometimes uh, play a role. Mm, no, I haven't cut with that. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we. I mean, an, an implicit assumption of the model is that you have uniform coverage. Again, kind of, you know, obviously, towards the ends, it goes down, but it's a uniform coverage. Um, and that's an implicit assumption in the model. Um, I haven't accounted for other things. I think it would be complicated and also quite hard, but you need extra information. And also, you need a good model, right? Because, um, yeah. you know. 
you know, if you model it wrong, then it's best not to do it at all. You need also a good model, which which is probably not that easy to formulate. But no, I haven't I haven't even looked at it. I have to be honest. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to go through a another package we've done, which we haven't published um, yet. I mean, we have a preprint probably in winter. Uh, and this is, I mean, conceptually, it's very similar to bandits, but it, ex it extends bandits. So it, it, it's differential regulation, it's called the package. Um, and what the package does is to take the idea of bandits and use it in a different context on, sing on well, single cell data for now, but also bulk later, uh, to do a different kind of biological analysis. But obviously we had to do some modification. So it, it, it's a mathematical similar model that, but a slight, a slight extension. Um, so again, I'm gonna give a brief introduction about here, the biology. So on, um, you know, in, again, in transcription, we've seen you, you can transcribe an unspliced mRNA or immature. And then with splicing, you have a mature or spliced mRNA uh, that yes, of course, can degrade later. Now, in bulk data, we actually have good resolution about the range of transcripts or spliced mRNAs. In single cell data, resolution is quite low at the transcript level. But, I mean, at least for bulk, for droplet, sorry, for droplet single cell data. But um, you can still distinguish between the unspliced mRNAs at the gene level and the spliced mRNAs. So you don't know what transcript they're coming from, but you can still separate the mRNAs which are mature and immature. Now, you're probably wondering why is this useful if you don't distinguish the transcript? Because that is still informative and that can give information about the direction of gene expression. For instance, like kind of the most notable example of this is RNA velocity. Now in RNA velocity, you use this information to study the derivative of spliced mRNA. Now in mathematics, the derivative tells you the change that you will have in your, in this case, spliced mRNA in the near in the near future. And so the assumption behind this is that if you have a higher unspliced ratio, a spliced proportion, then you would expect at equilibrium, then a gene is probably being upregulated because this large fraction of unspliced mRNA will be spliced and it will increase, it will increase the spliced mRNA more than the decrease that is, going, that is going to happen because of the degradation. Vice versa, if you have a lower unspliced relative abundance, then you would expect the equilibrium. Then you probably have down regulation of a gene because the newly spliced mRNA will not fully compensate the large amount of spliced mRNA that is going to be degraded. So basically looking at the relative abundance of spliced and unspliced mRNAs gives you a hint about what's happening in the future. So if gene abundance is going up or down, very simply. So we take this idea and we use it to compare experimental conditions. So we basically check for differences in the relative abundance of unspliced mRNA between conditions. And so if a condition has a higher relative abundance of unspliced mRNA, then we speculate that that condition is being upregulated, not in absolute terms, but compared to the other condition. Now, again, this is different from differential gene abundance because differential gene expression would simply look at the differences in the overall abundance of spliced mRNA. Here, we look at differences in the near future change. So in the direction of, of the spliced abundance on whether it's going up or down. Now, since we have single cell data, we can cluster cells that are similar into clusters, typically cell types, and then we do the analysis on every cell clustered separately. So we cluster cells and then we identify changes in regulation that are specific to a cell type. And this is, for instance, a, a very sketched output of what you would get. In this case, for instance, we're comparing three and six month brain organoids. And we can see that this particular gene in this particular cluster has a higher abundance, higher relative abundance of unspliced mRNA. And so we would speculate that it's being upregulated at six months compared to three months. So again, it's not absolute up-down regulation, but it's always in relative terms between two conditions. Now let's get into the mathematical aspect or better, better technical one actually, but at the mathematical. 
Now, how do we get these splice and splice reads? Again, we can use pseudo aligners like Alevin, Alevin Phi, Callisto Bus tools, which are basically the, the analog on single cell data of then uh, the analog of uh, Salmon and Callisto. But just like in bulk data, we have uncertainty. And here it is to a larger extent because on droplet data, we have mapping uncertainty on two levels. So we have reads that are compatible between the spliced and unspliced versions of a gene. So within a single gene, you're not sure whether those reads are actually spliced or unspliced because obviously spliced reads, spliced and unspliced genes will have parts that are in common. We have exons that are in common between them. And those amounts in our analysis, between, those are represent some 5, 20% of the reads. But then additionally, while in bulk data, you, you rarely have reads that map to multiple genes. Here you have a significant fraction of the reads that actually map to multiple genes because you only observe really the beginning of the reads. So very often you have multi-mapping reads between different genes and those amount to roughly 5, 40% of the reads. So there is a lot of uncertainty in these estimates. And so once again, we try to account for this mapping uncertainty and we do it in two different ways. For the mapping uncertainty that concerns the genes, we use again a latent variable approach. So we sample the gene that reads come from. For the mapping uncertainty that concerns the ambiguous reads, so spliced, unspliced, we consider something like that, but that is actually quite challenging because the probability that a read is spliced or unspliced is very hard to estimate because it depends on several factors that are not known. For instance, coverage is not uniform and you have multiple splices and multiple unspliced transcripts. Those have different lengths. And importantly, you don't know their abundance uh, because you, you only know things at the gene level. So this probability, the probability that an ambiguous read is spliced or unspliced is unknown. And so we still try the latent variable approach, assuming in a very, very rough way that this probability is 50%. So ambiguous reads are, have a 50% probability of being spliced and 50% of being unspliced. Now, this is obviously very rough. Uh, and alternatively, we've tried a different approach where we artificially increase the, the parameter space. Now, in biology, we have spliced or unspliced reads. But from a technical point of view, we have spliced, unspliced, and ambiguous reads. And so we try to model this trivariate vector, uh, which, which accounts for the technical aspect. And we've seen that this actually, this approach works better, which is also intuitive because kind of, you know, assuming 50% probability without actually having an idea of how much that probability is, is, well, you know, trivially a rough choice. And so in the end, we actually go for this choice and we enlarge the, the space of the parameters you considering the relative abundance of splice, unspliced, and ambiguous reads. And so in this case, we can have a, a Dirichlet multinomial like before, but as I said, this is an extension. We have two models, one model for every gene, and this is basically like in bandits. This is a Dirichlet multinomial like in bandits for every gene. So you have a relative abundance of unspliced, spliced, and ambiguous reads. So by the way, this is ordered in this way simply because it it reads as USA, and so this is a bit catcher. Um, but then additionally, compared to bandits, you also have another model, which is a multinomial, and it tells you the relative abundance of genes. Now, this model, per se, we're not interested in that one. We're interested in these relative abundances. But this model is useful because of the latent variable allocation that we do across different genes. And again, let's make an Example, the latent variable allocation, again, it's similar to what we have shown before, but it accounts for these double uh, pi vectors. And so if a read is compatible, again, with the spliced version of gene G and the unspliced version of gene J, then it's allocated to the first choice with probability, which is proportional to what? Well, the relative abundance of gene G and the relative abundance of the spliced version of gene G. And to the second case, it's allocated with probability proportional to the relative abundance of gene J and the relative abundance of the unspliced version of gene J. So anyway, it's basically the product of the two probabilities and then normalized so that they, they make one. And then you do that this iteratively. So conceptually, it's the same. Mathematics is just a little bit more difficult because you have two layers instead of one. 
So how does the how do we proceed with the pipeline? Because now we have both that we have single cell data. Well, we first group cells into clusters. So as I said, we do cell type specific changes to identify. But then in each cluster, we actually aggregate signal across all cells because our model actually does not distinguish between uh, between cells. So we compute pseudo bulk measurements in every cluster. And then we do our inference in every cluster separately. Just like before, we have a region dispersion parameter. And again, we use an informative prior from, from all the other genes. So we have, again, a, an empirical, a mildly empirical based approach. Um, and then we proceed pretty much like in bandits. So we want to look for differences in this vector now, unspliced, spliced, ambiguous reads. And so we do testing with a multivariate world um, approximation on the posterior of this, of this guy here. Uh, so conceptually, as I said, it's a similar model, but maybe just to clarify the differences, here we have a double mapping uncertainty. And so we have a two layer model. Uh, and then and the framework is actually quite different. Also, another thing which we haven't done yet, but it's, it's, it's ongoing, is that so far we apply the method to single cell data. And so we identify changes at the gene level, but in cell, cell type specific changes, so in specific populations of cells. But we're actually extending this to also work on bulk data. And the interesting thing is that you can go deep in a different direction, because obviously on bulk data, you have a, an average signal across many cells. So you cannot identify changes on, you know, on specific cell types, but you can identify changes that are specific to transcripts. So you can identify changes at the transcript level. And so you can identify the individual transcripts which show differential regulation, which show differences in regulation. So roughly we've done benchmarks on this one comparing to two other methods that do this kind of analysis on single cell data. I didn't find many, honestly, I only found these two methods. And both of them obviously ignore the mapping uncertainty, which is, again, the whole motivation of our work. Um, and we proceed similarly to what I've shown before. We take a real data set, and so we have real data observations. We split it into two groups, and we introduce artificially a difference. So again, we, take, we have real data, but now we have artificially introduced a difference that we try to identify. Now we do it into, into two ways. We introduce a difference into regulation and also one in differential gene expression that we don't want to detect because it's a nuisance difference. Then we simulated the read level with MINNO, again, in order to have mapping uncertainty, and we get back our, our parameters. So similar plot as before, true positive versus false discovery rate. We want to be on the top left corner, and we see we are, again, in green. I mean, this is by chance, but I, I, I tend to have green methods. Okay. Um, but it also was in green. I didn't notice that before. So you see that the other methods tend to have, first of all, a strong inflation of the false discovery rate. So basically, they, they try to provide a 1, 5, and 10% false discovery rate, but eventually they get a much larger amount. Uh, well, we roughly control for the false discovery rate. And at the same time, we have higher true positive rate, meaning that we can recover more real um, differential genes. Uh, again, roughly wrapping up, uh, we propose a method similar to bandits, but now we have two sources of mapping uncertainty, and, and therefore we have this double model. We're actually developing a double analysis framework for single cell data, so cell type specific changes, but at the gene level and on bulk data transcript specific changes, but on uh, across all cells. I haven't shown a computational benchmark, but obviously we have a speed concern compared to methods that just input uh, estimates and don't account for the mapping uncertainty. And just like bandits, we don't account for covariates, but once again, here we're again looking at relative abundances within genes. And so it's unlikely that covariates and batch effects will play a role on relative abundances. Um, yeah, maybe I can stop again if there are a couple of questions on this one, and then I'll just show you a hint of a, of a preliminary work on proteomics.
we don't okay. see anything. Perhaps. Yeah. So I, I, I can slow. I can slow down. Uh, I, I was rushing a lot because I, I I I was expecting a lot of questions, but now I can slow down since we have we have more time. Um, this one actually. Uh, are there questions? No, no, there is no, there are no questions in the room, but we'd say okay. so, all good. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so this is actually kind of a job adver adver advertisement, but I don't actually have funding. So I I will talk about a project uh, which uh, is aimed at integrating proteomics and transcriptomics. Uh, this is, again, to develop a statistical method that we will release as uh, an R package. I think this is the most interesting method I have done. I have, well, I have ongoing at least so far. Um, this one was actually awarded a Marie Curie fellowship, which is a two year postdoc fellowship, but I cannot accept it because of my position, because it's incompatible. So I'm actually looking for someone who is interested to apply and do this um, and, and apply to a Marie Curie fellowship with me as, as a supervisor. So if you're not, if you don't know what a Marie Curie is, it's basically uh, the European postdoc fellowship it's two or three years, depending on whether it's, you know, two years in one place and three years if you go one year abroad. Uh, the salary is really high, and they also have a good research budget, basically 1,000 euros per, per month. The applications are in September, but if you're interested, we need to obviously prepare. And, and so, I mean, uh, in case you're interested in this, let me know uh, by sometime in winter. So now I'll actually talk about the project. Um, now, the aim of the project is, is to infer proteins. How do you infer proteins so far? Normally with bottom-up proteomics, where basically you don't observe proteins directly, but you observe peptides. And so again, uh, you use peptides as a surrogate marker for the proteins. But again, just like in transcriptomics, you have a multi-mapping issue because most of the peptides are compatible with multiple proteins. Like this peptide here is compatible with proteins A, B, C and D. So when you see a signal at the peptide level, you don't really know what protein it's coming from. Now, this is very, very similar to the, sorry, I apologize for doing this thing. Uh, this is very similar to multi-mapping width we have in rna seq data. But here we can kind of solve the problem and we can estimate the abundance of transcripts. Now, why can we not do the same in proteomics? Well, because the data are of lower quality. There are many fewer peptides than there are RNA-seq reads. And also we have an issue with the uh, intensity of the peptides because the, the relationship between the protein abundance and the peptide abundance is not linear. In RNA-seq data, if, a, if the abundance of a, of a transcript doubles, you can roughly expect the RNA-seq RNA reads to double. This is not the same here. If a protein doubles in abundance, the peptide abundance is going to increase but it's not really going to increase linearly. It's not, it's not really going to double. So we have a lot more uncertainty here. And that's why we cannot really do inference at the isoform level. So what do you normally do in transcriptomics? Well, we, you normally work on groups of proteins, typically at the gene level. So you normally do inference at the gene level. And so you identify gene, gene that are present or abundance at the gene level. So what we aim to do is to actually do inference at the isoform level. Well, how can we do that? The issue with this, the issue, the main problem with this kind of, uh, with this kind of data um, has to do with the data itself. And so the way we tackle it is by using more data. And by that, I don't mean using more proteomic data. Uh, I mean using a different kind of data. In practice, we want to jointly model proteomics and transcriptomics data because transcriptomics data is a lot more accurate and we can use that as a prior for the proteomics data. Because obviously mRNAs are then translated into proteins and there is a good correlation of normally 65, 70% between protein and transcript abundance. So we can use that to enhance the information that we have. So what is our goal? Our goal is to basically have a model that can infer if an individual isoform is present in a database and also estimate its abundance. But we're statisticians, so we also want to give a measure of the uncertainty of these estimates. And so we can do that with a posterior probability of the presence of an isoform and with a posterior credible interval of its abundance. 
Then in a later stage, we're actually going to extend this and jointly sample and jointly model multiple samples, basically biological replicates, so that we can average out the biological noise and get a group level answer. And once we do that, we can easily compare groups of samples. So healthy, diseased again, treated, untreated, and do differential testing, not at the gene level, but at the isoform level. So just to give a very uh, simple and naive example application, we know that in um, uh, this transcript, the transcription factor, this transcription factor here is differentially abundant between some types of melanoma. But we don't actually know what specific isoforms are differentially abundant. So our method would basically try to answer that question and get a more accurate uh, identification of the uh, isoforms that are differentially abundant. In mathematical terms, you have some input data, which are basically the abundance of the peptides. You know what proteins are associated to each peptide. Again, each peptide is associated to one or typically more proteins. And then that's the case bit. You have the relative abundance of transcripts, which is estimated from RNA-seq data. But what you want to infer is about proteins. So you want to infer the total and relative abundance of the proteins. So we, we start from these guys and we want to get there. <clears throat> I have implemented just a sketch, uh, which again, has a multinomial Dirichlet uh, structure, because I think it's a natural structure with this kind of data. Uh, but there are alternative ideas which I, I'm, I'm going to consider. Uh, so why a multinomial? Because again, you, have, you can think of the overall signal across all the proteins in your data, and you can distribute that to your protein isoforms. How will you distribute that according to the relative abundance of the proteins? which follows a Dirichlet prior. And so where does the transcriptomics data enter here? Well, it enters here. Your prior is very informative and the information is coming from the transcriptomics data. So we use the relative abundance of transcripts as an informative prior for the relative abundance of proteins. And then again, we have this peptide information and or abundance, and we try to again allocate it back to the to the proteins that are compatible with with this peptide, and we do that again with a latent variable model. Now, this is not the only model I have in mind. This is the one I sketched because I'm familiar with it, but I think an alternative, a natural alternative, is to have a mixture model where your peptide signal is a mixture of the protein signals. And it's something that we, we, will, uh, we will investigate. Now, in terms of validation, um, we normally, as you've seen, we normally validate these tools in simulations because we try to simulate data. We have a current truth and we validate it. We see if we can basically recover to get close to the ground truth. This is not possible in this kind of scenario unless you make a naive simulation, which is not realistic and it's absolutely not informative because there is no uh, good simulator for mass spectrometry proteomics data. So in practice, the realistic simulation happens in the lab. And thankfully, we collaborate with biologists in the States that are doing experiments to validate our tool in the lab. And so what I mean by that is that they collect some data, they have a ground truth, and so we can see if we can be able to recover that. Uh, in more... Ma less mathematical and more informal terms, this is the kind of output that our model uh, provides. Here you have a bunch of proteins. You see that the first part of the ID tells you that all these guys are from the same gene. So these are all different isoforms from this gene. And this is again a bunch of isoforms from a different gene. So what do we provide? Well, the probability that these isoforms are actually present in the data sets. In this case, this guy will have a high probability the other ones have a low probability, and then an estimate of the abundance and a posterior credible interval around this abundance that, give, that, for instance, indicates how uncertain we are about the abundance of this gene. Um, I don't know where to take the question now. Okay, I'll take the question now and, and continue later. Uh, hi. <laughs> hello. Sorry, I'm... Impressive. Okay. Maybe, maybe, yes. So I wanted to ask if he is aware of the RiboSeq profiling method 
that allows to understand that which are the RNAs that are being translated at a certain moment. Did you, oh. did you, yeah, did you understand that? Uh, a little bit, uh, it's connected to ribosic, um, but maybe yeah. Again. Yeah, exactly. Because I think that would be a validation and experimental validation of your model in a better way than doing RNA seq and uh, mass spec in parallel. I think ribosic would be the best combination to, because you can do two in one and then at the same time, even for the same size. Yes, so yes, the was. There was this was mentioned in the discussion. Now the issue is the issues are that I, I, I know very little about the biology, and uh, this is very much ongoing. So I only I only understand the biology when I'm done with the project. Uh, this one is still ongoing. I actually don't remember. I don't remember because I post this project. Um, and that's why I'm actually looking for someone to take it over. Uh, I don't remember how and if we were going to see to use ribosic data in our in our project it, it was definitely part of the discussion yeah okay but I, I really don't remember uh how we 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 wanted to connect that definitely not in the model but in the validation yes so that that, that was a possibility we discussed mm -hmm. no. another question from the room so i, I try to speak can you hear me yeah yeah very well so um, I was wondering if you think it would be possible like, to make a, a universal ground truth in regards to this uh, mass spectrometry data, for example. So let's say that you have a bunch of proteins and you, you would experimentally kind of verify how much those are, you know, um, how you say like, how much those they are present in a certain mixture, and then you could kind of use those parameters as prior for your simulation and for for those proteins. So you see what I mean? So that, that you build kind of a database of priors that is taken experimentally, and then you could use it as a you know as a as a ground truth for, for your data for your simulation. I'm, I'm not I'm not sure this is possible. Maybe um, I mean I forgot to clarify this. I apologize, uh, but the prior is specific to the sample you're using. So every sample in every sample you collect, uh, you know, mass spectrometry and RNA seq data on that specific sample. So that the prior is sample specific, uh, because otherwise that I think that would be too general. It wouldn't it wouldn't be informative enough. So I mean I, I I don't I don't I don't think you could build a general uh, prior knowledge uh, that you could always use regard I mean for all the samples you analyze if that was the question. Yes, maybe though you could kind of build relational, you know, of, uh, of expression. So because I mean I I think I mean what I know that. Um, so there are some clusters of proteins that they are more expressed than others, right? Mm -hmm. And so some proteins also they tend to be expressed together more than, than other proteins. Maybe yeah, maybe there is a variation tissue wise, but um, maybe this could help account in the case of your model. That's right. What the the final part? Maybe this could help. Maybe this could help in, in your model, like to predict eventual, you know, relation in, for proteins, um, quantification, or something like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not something we have uh, considered so far. Um, there were a few uh, thoughts we had about, in general, other pieces of information we could uh, we could incorporate in the model. Um, so I think we will consider other pieces of information, again, to try and add more data in the model so that we can uh, get more reliable results. Um, but uh, this, this is quite preliminary, so we haven't really explored a lot the space of the possible things that we could, uh, uh, we could add and include. Uh, there were several others. I mean, we can consider this one as well. There were several others like uh, the ORF quality, and uh, yeah, but I mean, we have we haven't done that. I, I can be short. <laughs> okay.
Okay, maybe I should the very final slide actually. Um, so I said we have this is preliminary again. We haven't benchmarked this on even in, even like on experimental data, but we tested it on, on on some real data, and we obtained some results which are I would say comforting. I mean they, they are reasonable. They go in a in a good direction. So here you have the you know tip log TPMs, so the you know chasquit abundance, and then on the y-axis you have log protein abundance, which are estimated from the model on the same isoform. So this is isoform level, you know, transcript versus estimated proteins. Now you see when we don't have an informative prior, so we only use mass spectrometry data, the two are not much correlated. You have correlation of 19% because there is just not enough information in the data to actually get good estimates. But when we use an informative prior, and you see here on the right, then you get a correlation of 63%. And you see there is good agreement between our estimates of the protein isoforms and the corresponding transcript abundances. And just to put that in context, at the gene level, this correlation is about 65% on this data set. So that's kind of where at the most you can get uh, because that, that is aggregating transcripts. But obviously, once you also add noise and variability across transcripts, you will have a value which is close to that one, but obviously a bit slower. So this, again, this is not a, full, a proper validation, but it indicates that uh, results are reasonable and we can definitely get a much better job when we use that prior information from the transcript data. And the other comforting bit is that uh, the isoforms were stratified into three categories, depending on their kind of translation ability. So on their ability, to translate proteins. And so in like low, medium, and high quality of uh, say translation. And we can see that this correlation is actually quite low for, for isoforms, which have a low ability, a low translation ability, uh, which is expected because they, you know, they don't translate really well the, uh, the transcripts. Well, for those that have a medium or high translation ability, then this correlation uh, uh, increases, which again is reasonable and comforting because you know, the more the the more an isoform is able to translate, the more we, we would expect coherency between transcripts and proteins. Um, so I will stop here. If you want some references, I think there's shared a slide. Um, here, here you have the um, the kind of the packages and, and the paper. Uh, this is still going, but I'm, I'm referring to a paper where they initially tried to 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 use this setup. Uh, this is a picture of the Robinson lab where I've been for, for six years. And yeah, I'd like to thank Mark who was supervised me in all these projects and uh, a lot of quotes and in general, the lab. And lastly, yesterday we had the David, but today I decided to go for for, for painting. So I'll, I'll close with uh, with this uh, circus from Kandinsky. So thank you for being here until 6.30, which is quite late.